My name's Mark Edenborough. I'm Port Macquarie Hastings Council's Senior Stormwater Engineer. I sit in the infrastructure planning team where my role is involved with the planning of the design, upkeep, meaning maintenance and acceptance and ongoing condition of Council's multitude of stormwater assets. From a community perspective, in our urban areas, Council is in charge of and controls approximately 13 and a half thousand stormwater pipes. We've got over 14,000 pits, about 110 stormwater basins which perform water quality and stormwater detention, meaning flood attenuation. We also have another 80 gross pollutant traps which perform stormwater quality protection of waterways as well. My role encompasses all those assets where we essentially involved in the maintenance, management and upkeep of all of those with the ultimate aim of keeping the community safe from flooding and the environment protected from what flows into our waterways from the stormwater system. How are these systems maintained? We have two full-time stormwater maintenance crews. Those crews consist of two men and usually a, a truck and an excavator and they're essentially on the road 365 days a year performing a range of tasks from fixing failures and sinkholes to cleaning out stormwater basins for, of silt and sediment which accumulates over time. The stormwater is different to rainwater, different to potable water. Stormwater is essentially the water that falls from the sky, lands on the ground and flows into the drainage system. And the difference from the rainwater that falls on the ground and the potable water that comes out of the taps is that stormwater is water that falls on the ground plus everything that contains in it. So in an urban area like where I'm standing here now, stormwater can include chip packets, cigarette butts, soil, water, grease from the roads, nutrients that are washed off someone's lawn, detergents from someone's cars, and all of that material that ends up in the gutters, flowing into the pits and pipes and ending up in our system. We've got over 14,000 stormwater pits, and each of those pits represent a point of infiltration of stormwater into the pipes underground. Those pipes, as you'd know, would flow into creeks, gullies, rivers, and ultimately the ocean and the beaches where we all enjoy our recreational time. The easiest place to find stormwater infrastructure in an urban area is looking at the bottom of the hill. That's where we'll find the, the largest and, and most highest concentration of stormwater assets because naturally stormwater flows downhill. So at the bottom of the hill is where we have the largest amount of stormwater and the, and the need for the largest amount of infrastructure. For anyone that is interested, we do have on our council's website full mapping of our stormwater network available where you can navigate around, drill down to individual levels of pits and pipes or have a look at the entire network and the entire catchment, seeing essentially from where your own house is, you could follow the pits and pipes downstream to the creek, gully, river or ocean to see where runoff from your own property or yard ends up in essence. We have a very detailed system online which is used not just by interested residents, but by consultants when they're designing everything from new roads to buildings and subdivisions. Most important consideration from my perspective when managing stormwater is stormwater quality and quantity. Quantity meaning how much water and where is it going to and how fast, and quality meaning what is that stormwater containing. From a quantity perspective, it's very important, obviously, that we size things correctly. How many pits have we got in a road? What size are the pipes? And are they large enough? And are there enough of them to convey stormwater safely away? If we get that wrong, we can have roads that are flooding, we can have houses that are inundated, and you can have general unsafe situations. From a quality perspective, Council has various standards that specify minimum standards for water quality. When we're doing any design, be it a new road, a new subdivision, we set targets for what is acceptable to be discharged to the waterway. And that generally results in the integration of water quality controls into all of those new works. And those water quality controls can be in the form of a gross pollutant trap, which is probably the simplest, which is a structural measure. It's an underground pit that contains various baffles, and screens and the like. Oils and greases can float to the surface, for example, that may have nets or screens inside it, and chambers that are designed in certain ways to allow your silt and sediment and, and heavier debris to sink to the bottom. In addition to gross pollutant traps, other methods of stormwater quality control include swales, which are essentially open drains where we allow water to run across the surface of the land. So the difference between that and a traditional pipe drainage approach is by allowing stormwater to run through the grass, for example, in a swale, the grass can capture and settle out pollutants such as your oils and greases, your fine sediments, soil particles, and prevent those from entering the waterway. A next level down the list would be something such as a bioretention basin or a wetland, where we rely on microbiobial action 
at the cellular level within the plants to pull out nutrients such as your phosphorus and nitrogens from the water. And what we do is we incorporate a range of these measures into different developments to target the pollutants that we know are a risk from those areas. Technology in the stormwater space has changed very drastically over the last 20 or 30 years. A lot of the older parts of town, the original parts of Port Macquarie, don't have any stormwater quality controls in them at all, or detention facilities. In the mid-90s, stormwater detention as a philosophy came to play as, as a means of addressing the flooding that was happening across Australia at the time in urban developments. And it probably wasn't until the early 2000s that water quality took off in this area. Prior to that, it was probably 50-50 where the new subdivision in included very basic sediment ponds aimed at just capturing from the subdivision. And the target of those basins was actually more to capture the sediment that was generated during construction, not so much what's occurring after the houses have been built and the people have moved in. From the mid 2000s onwards though, the sort of technologies have become best practice, whereby new developments include gross pollutant traps, they include vegetated swales, bioretention systems, wetlands, all these systems that in from a stormwater space are currently best practice are now incorporated into newer developments. A majority of our area was developed earlier than the 2000s, back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and they don't have those existing controls. We are working towards identifying the resultant pollutant risks, but at present those areas are largely unserviced by stormwater quality infrastructure. When Council does upgrades to our stormwater networks to address flooding issues, or to upgrade a road, for example, we are incorporating new water quality controls where feasible, and that's usually in the form of a gross pollutant trap, because they're very efficient in the amount of space they take up. But as far as in implementing wetlands or bioretention basins and those larger, greener assets into existing areas, we're very limited by the amount of space we have. From a new subdivision or, or new development perspective, such as where we're standing here in Sovereign Hills today, if, if you're looking at the bottom of the hill behind us here, there's a, a natural stream that was realigned as part of the subdivision works. In the base of this stream is what's called a bioretention swale. It's about a 300 millimetre deep sand filter layer. So in small flows, the water, you mightn't see it flowing across the surface of the land, but it flows through that sand. And the results there is that the, the grasses and the plants that you see growing in this swale behind us here, their roots and the action of the bacteria on the roots of those plants essentially eats and removes the nitrogens and the, and the phosphorus from the stormwater runoff. The plants themselves, they slow the flow of runoff to a point where your, your coarse sediments such as your sand and, and your silt and your gravel and dirt that may wash into a stormwater system is slowed to an extent where it can settle out and pond in the drain itself. And then your larger pieces of litter, you know, your chip packets and bottles and leaves, whatnot, get caught up in the fronds of the grasses in there. So essentially a system like this what it's doing is it's pulling out the nutrients, it's pulling out the, the silt and sediment and, and the coarse pollutants before it reaches a downstream waterway, which in this case is the Lake Innes catchment. Here we are at the culverts here under Sovereign Drive in Sovereign Hills. This here um, is what's called a fauna underpass, which has been put in place because this creek corridor itself actually works as a um, wildlife corridor where animals can go from bushland at one end of the estate to the other via this natural creek system. What we've found out over time is that animals such as koalas and possums don't like to go underneath these culverts on the ground. It's not a natural surface for them. So as part of the construction of these systems, these fauna underpasses are actually implemented, whereby we've just got trees that were harvested on the site naturally as part of the development being repurposed and creating essentially a bridge for a, a native animal to feel more comfortable on as it walks through this man-made structure. This kumbungee or bulrush is a, is a native vegetation which grows in all standing waterways throughout our LGA. It does perform a really important stormwater quality function in that the density of this grass slows down the flow of water allowing silt and sediment to settle out. It also captures any gross pollutants such as your plastics, bottles, leaf litter and the like, and prevents it from ending up lower in the waterway. With this culvert here, you may also be able to see that for the slab we're standing on here is probably about half a metre higher than the ground level through here. This is a best practice stormwater design method that's been implemented at this culvert here, 
we've got eight cells of culverts running under the road here, but the middle two are set at a lower level. That allows this to be wet full time underneath here, even in small flows, so allowing for any fish or turtles or aquatic life to continue to pass through under here, even in dry times. Standing here in the vacant paddocks opposite the IGA in Sovereign Hills at the moment, what we have here in front of us doesn't look like much, but underneath these two steel lids is a environmental branded gross pollutant trap. It essentially looks like a large tank. It's about four metres deep, but inside it, the stormwater runoff from the IGA site and the street adjacent is fed into that tank where a number of baffles and screens cause the water to create a vortex. And what that movement does is it causes the sediment may come from a typical road catchment to settle to the bottom. The pollutants are pushed against the screen and captured and clean water is essentially allowed to pass out. There's another step in that process whereby water goes through and under a baffle to collect water and grease. But in essence, from a council perspective now, what we need to do is six monthly, come out here with a truck, pull these two lids off, suck out all the pollutant and reset it. And it's essentially a set and forget kind of system. But in essence, what it results in is, is those pollutants that you get captured in a typical commercial environment, such as the IGA, the road and the adjoining car park, can be captured in this underground gross pollutant track and prevented from entering the downstream Partridge Creek environment. So what we have here is another example of best practice stormwater quality management infrastructure in implemented in the Sovereign Hills Estate. What you're probably used to seeing is, is roads such as what you might find out in front of your house where the middle of the road's high and it drains to the edges, where we've got normal curb inlet pits and pits and pipes under the curbs. What you see here is the roads draining the opposite way. It drains into the middle where we've got a garden bed running lengthwise along the length of the street. What, what happens here is that silts and sediments and oils and greases from the road run across the surface into this garden bed where those pollutants can be treated by the vegetation, the filter media meaning the rocks and the sand that are in there before it enters the pits and the pipes that are in the middle of the road. So, we're standing here in front of another large stormwater basin here in Sovereign Hills, Port Macquarie. Uh, this basin here actually performs two purposes. So it's, a, it's a different to the swale and, and the creek system that we looked at earlier. This basin performs both a detention and a water quality function, whereby in the base of this basin behind being the, the bottom section there is a bioretention system, another one of those sand filters that, that polishes the quality of the runoff. But the depth of this, this has got many metres of potential storage above it. So the way it's been designed is it'll polish water in, the, in your frequent storm events. But when we get a major storm event, this basin will fill up and there's an outlet on the downstream side of this basin consisting of a pit and some pipes out of it that have been sized in a specific way to limit the rate at which water can flow out of the basin. So what we result in is, in a, in a major storm event, comparing it to what was here prior to this subdivision going ahead, We've now got roofs, we've got roads, we've got over the hill behind us here, we've got the, the service station, McDonald's, the Olivers, all that development draining into this basin. And what that means in comparison to pre-development state is that there's a lot more water arriving here a lot faster than it would have naturally done. The detention basin, what it does is it fills up and with a controlled outlet, we can limit the rate and the volume of runoff leaving this basin to something that matches what it would have been prior to the development going ahead. So in a storm, you'll see the basin go up, and then when the storm finishes, it will slowly drain away. But the rate at which that runoff's leaving the basin, in theory, should match what happened prior to development. And we do that in these subdivisions as a means of making sure that we're not increasing the rate of flow in the downstream creek, which could cause additional flooding or erosion. So the basin itself here is, is performing those functions of water quality and detention. Looking at this basin here behind us, you can clearly see there's a lot of establishing vegetation. The aim with these basins generally when they're designed is, is we plant them out very densely with native plants that are endemic to this area, meaning they're not just native Australians, but they grow naturally in this area, so they should thrive. But with native plants, a lot of the time, they take many years to grow and to establish. The idea with these basins is, is we plant them out in such a way that hopefully they can grow nice and dense and essentially get to a point where they are indistinguishable between a basin and natural bushland. And if we can get to that point and we can keep the weeds out, they should be very low maintenance from a vegetation perspective because native vegetation, this is its natural climate, its natural environment. In theory, we should be very low maintenance from a stormwater perspective. 
from your own house, from your, from your workplace, from your school, there's many things you can do that can limit the impact that your activities have on the environment and have on our basins. Things such as washing your car on the lawn at home, not dropping litter on the ground are obvious ones, but there are less obvious things such as when you mow the lawn or you sweep up the backyard, a lot of people will blow back those clippings down the drain or just leave them on the road to blow away. Organic waste from something as simple as grass clippings, when it gets into the waterway, it breaks down and it consumes the oxygen in the water, which can lead to water bodies becoming lifeless and dead, not supporting life. So when you do mow your lawn or do some gardening at home, any clippings that may remain, make sure you sweep them up, pick them up, put them in your green waste bin so they don't end up in our waterways. On that note, I should also add that a lot of your garden clippings often contain seeds from non-native plants that we like to put in our gardens. So by picking them up, they're not getting into our basins, into our waterways, into our rivers. They can't take root in our ecosystem and, and take over our native plants. There's obvious things like when you're fertilising your gardens. From a stormwater perspective, it's key to ensure that you only use what you need. Don't over fertilise your yard. Don't fertilise if there's significant rainfall on the way so we're not going to get runoff into the drainage system. And any overspray, or if you happen to throw a handful on the driveway, make sure you clean it up. Those nutrients end up in our waterway and they benefit the introduced species, the weeds in the water system, whereby our natives, they don't really respond to them. So if, if you let your fertilizers get into the stormwater system, you're promoting weed growth in our gullies, in our creeks, in our waterways. From an Australian natural vegetation perspective, Australia is a traditional, very dry climate and our vegetation has established over many thousands and millions of years to, to grow in these environments where there's not a lot of nutrient load. There's infrequent rainfall in many instances. And so what we have is an environment that Australian native plants thrive in the weather conditions that we're used to with low nutrient levels. The kind of pollutants that I want to prevent from entering our waterways, our native vegetation doesn't really respond to them. However, the weed species that you see in our front yards, in, in the gutters, unfortunately in a lot of our creek systems, do thrive when they're provided with high nutrient laden stormwater flows. By preventing those nutrients from getting into our waterways, we're allowing this natural vegetation to thrive and slowing the growth of weed species which can enter the system. In essence, if they're allowed to thrive in those systems, they will take over. That stormwater ultimately reaches the downstream larger water bodies, which in subdivision here in Sovereign Hills, the western half is dra draining to Lake Innes Direct. Those nutrients can lead to algal blooms in the lake or any standing water bodies if they're not appropriately managed. Those algal blooms can lead to fish kills, again, the smothering of aquatic vegetation that is native and outbreaks of weed species, which is the last thing we want in our pristine waterways. definitely need to know quite a lot about <laughs> flora and fauna as part of being a stormwater engineer. Myself, I've got a Bachelor of Engineering through Sydney University and a Master's in Environmental Planning. So obviously the interface between urban runoff and the natural environment. It's not just what may have been old school engineers versus planners versus ecologists. You need to know a lot more about a lot more things to work in the industry today whereby something as simple as being able to identify a weed versus a native when you're planning the maintenance of a basin, or what tree species benefit the local wildlife better than others is very important when we're looking at areas such as this where we've got it landscaped with eucalypts, where we've got it landscaped with native grasses that are endemic to the area, such as the lamandras, which you may be able to see on the bank over there, or these various species of eucalypt that are primary browse species, which means they're the primary food species to the koala populations in the area. If you're interested in or you're looking at becoming a stormwater engineer or involved in the stormwater industry, there's many pathways. Design has been my career focus, hence why I'm a civil engineer and a civil engineering background. But I guess if your interest is more around water quality and the impacts of stormwater discharge on the environment, perhaps something through a geosciences pathway may be more applicable in those cases. In Port Macquarie, we've got a range of qualifications that can get you into a stormwater field. Myself, as a civil engineer primarily, we also have surveyors, environmental scientists, environmental engineers. Any of those earth and geological science pathways through university can get you into a stormwater engineering field if that's a passion of yours.